All right. We'll kick things off now. So uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for uh, making it uh, down the hallway all the way to 332. Um, as I walked in, I realized that they changed the actual title of this session. So what I submitted was Power BI Overview. And what uh, it landed as is uh, everything you need to know about Power BI. So that's an overpromise. Um, but I am planning to step through end-to-end um, -end what the solution looks like. Um, and I'm actually planning to build something um, on stage from scratch. So we'll just start from one end, and we'll just walk all the way through to the other end. And hopefully, that'll give you a good feel for what the product is. And um, if uh, everything goes to plan, uh, we should have about 10 minutes or so at the end uh, for just some Q&A. So if you have any questions that you want to fire at me, feel free to do that. Prep ahead of time um, you know, as, uh, as I'm going through the, the session. And uh, we, should, uh, we should have about 10 minutes for that. I should also mention that this is sort of the overview session. So there are a bunch of drill down sessions uh, through the course of the week uh, for Power BI into all the topics that you'll see. So if you want to go deeper uh, in a particular area, there is a drill down session for that uh, in the agenda. So with that, let me start with um, why we do what we do uh, for Power BI, uh, just to set some context um, and some of the the trends that we're tracking um, in the product team uh, for Power BI. The first one, of course, is around this notion of big data. And I know that's not a term that's new to anybody in this room, um, but a lot of people have different definitions of big data. Um, and for me, I have a pretty simple mind. Uh, I like to kind of route it or uh, ground it in actual scenarios. So big data for me, apart from just large quantities of data, different types of data sort of coming um, on the scene. It's really about being able to leverage uh, data types that are new and unique and have been difficult to access in the past. For example, uh, sensor data. Um, a lot of organizations are doing more with sensor data, RFID tags and that type of thing. But think about social analytics. A lot of people are tapping into uh, social media to gain more insights into what their customers are actually talking about so that it can feed the decisions that are being made in the organization and so forth. Uh, also, public data is uh, becoming a lot more prevalent. If I think about the data.gov initiatives and some of the other data that's out there, being able to tap into that more easily and bring that into your analysis is an area where we focus. So um, that's what sort of we, we mean by uh, big data is there's um, obviously a lot of different elements to it, but really the changing data types out there and levering to, leveraging those is an area of interest for us. The other core trend that we really track is around this notion of consumerization of IT. And again, I'm really simple. So when I think about consumerization of IT, I really think that's just about choice. I, as an end user, want to be able to work on whatever devices I want to work on from wherever I want to work. Um, and that's uh, something that we're definitely tracking to in product and uh, building to satisfy that solution. So we'll talk about uh, that as well. Um, and then I added a quote here, which I thought was interesting, because it was the first time I actually saw quant around this. But essentially, and just to paraphrase what Gartner's saying is, hey, if you're an organization that's leveraging some of these new data types um, and bringing those inside the organization and making it easier for your end users to tap into that, well, you're probably going to outperform those organizations that don't do that by about 20%, which I thought was a really interesting stat. So I wanted to throw it up there. At Microsoft, when we think about um, the approach to uh, self-service BI or the, the space of self-service BI, uh, we really are kind of focused on making data more accessible. If I was to kind of boil it down to one thing, it's about that accessibility point. And we're really looking to do it in two ways. One is um, Excel itself. So Excel is a very accessible tool. Um, and because it's very pervasive, by delivering our BI capabilities or end user BI capabilities through that tool, it just helps make data access um, more accessible to more people. And that's why we do what we do with Excel to really make it a full fledged BI tool. And we'll talk a lot about that today. Um, the other thing that really makes BI a lot more accessible is some of the investments we're making in the cloud. You know, being able to uh, stand up uh, a BI portal experience. Um, in a matter of minutes so that people can start to share workbooks and it's fully rich and everything's sort of built into that experience and self-provisioned is um, 
really reducing a lot of the barriers to deploying BI. And that's just another example of how we see ourselves being able to make sort of data and data usage more uh, pervasive and more accessible to a lot of people. So Power BI, of course, is a subset of our all-up uh, BI approach. Um, and I'm going to focus now sort of on two elements of what uh, we do for self-service BI, two parts of the equation, if you will. Uh, the first is everything that we do inside of Excel. And Excel is the BI end user client for us, right? So we started down this journey about six years ago to really transform what Excel was into a full-fledged BI tool. And, you know, the first thing we introduced back then was Power Pivot. And Power Pivot was this in, or is, this in-memory technology um, that we built right into Excel. And it allowed for um, power users to more easily model out data, run and crunch that data in memory uh, so that they got the performance that they wanted when they were actually uh, processing data. Um, now, we've expanded that self-service BI experience since then in a couple of ways. One is the biggest hurdle that we saw for our end users to access information was finding the information they wanted to get, the data they wanted to get. You know, they, for them, it was very difficult to even know who the, uh, who the IT person to contact was, who the DBA in their organization was, let alone you know, understanding how to connect to that data, what their, creden their credentials needed to be, the access strings and all that kind of stuff. So we've built some new capabilities into Excel to make that a lot easier. Um, and we'll talk about that today. Um, and it, we also have built new capabilities in for end users to be able to clean up the data as they're pulling it in. So um, a lot of challenges, uh, the biggest challenge I hear from customers is, hey, I just need to pull data from multiple different sources together. I need to clean it, and I need to be able to analyze that. Help me do that uh, as in, from an end user perspective. Um, and we're doing a lot of that with the Power Query technology, and I'll, I'll show that uh, in action in our demo in a bit. Um, the next area is around visualization. So once I've got the data, I've modeled it out, it's running in memory, you know, how do I actually layer on really compelling visualizations to be able to explore my data? And we're doing a lot on this front as well. So uh, if, uh, if you're familiar, uh, we've built out some, uh, some new visualizations into Excel, the PowerView technology, the, uh, the Power Map technology as well, and we'll talk about those today. So once I've actually con you know, I've created my content, I've created my report, um, Power BI is then all about sharing that out. It's the service that runs in Office 365, which gives me the BI portal experience so that I, as an end user who've created something inside of Excel, I can publish that out into Office 365, into a experience that's really been tailored for business intelligence. Um, and then that experience allows me to um, more easily collaborate um, and a bunch of other stuff. I'm going to talk about all that other stuff in a bit. So let's focus first on Excel. So just a, a quick recap from the last year, um, because Excel's really kind of grown up. The first, and I mentioned this, was around discovery, uh, which is Power Query. And Power Query is a new feature inside of Excel uh, that really does self-service ETL, if you will. It's really tailored for the end user, um, and it provides some interesting new capabilities in it. One is um, in, around this notion of discoverability, uh, it allows an end user to actually search for data. So they no longer need to know where the database resides. They can just search the, uh, the terms that they're looking for of the data. Uh, and you'll see sort of an image of it here. Um, and the system will actually um, uh, take a look at those, that search criteria and present a set of data sources that are available uh, that match that search criteria. Now, if I'm using Excel disconnected from Power BI, and I run this search, what I get back is a list of public data sources. And the reason I get back a list of public data sources is because Microsoft's maintaining a search engine for data. Um, uh, think of it as Bing for data, if you will. And the team is actually indexing all the public data that's out there that we can get our hands on, right? So all the Wikipedia data that's out there is being indexed by the public data catalog, is what we call it. Um, and that's, that's a lot of data. There's over 100 million tables of data in Wikipedia alone. Uh, all the data.gov initiative data, that's all up there. Um, any other data that's public that we think is valuable will index into the data catalog. So now it's a lot easier for me as an end user to get uh, access to public data. 
which is great. The, thing, the next step we wanted to do was, can we make a version of that public data catalog, that public search engine, available for the enterprise? Um, and that's what we did. We brought that into Power BI for Office 365, the service. So now an organization uh, can do exactly what we're doing. They can go and they can index their corporate data and make it more discoverable for the end user. So when an end user now types and searches for data, what they get back is public data as well as their corporate data, the, the data that IT is provisioning for them. Um, and that just makes it a lot easier for me as an end user to then uh, discover that fiscal year 14 revenue number I'm looking for uh, and then connect through to it. Because once I see it in the list, I click it, and the system will understand who I am, and it will connect me directly to the data source for me. So it just it allows and facilitates for the actual connection to the data as well. And uh, if there's questions about that in the Q&A session, we can get into more detail as well. The next area, apart from just discovering the data, connecting to the data, cleaning up when you get it in, is really around this notion of modeling that data out. And um, you know, we've been talking a lot about Power Pivot for the last five years. And um, it really is taken Excel to the next level. So I don't know if you remember, well, I'm sure you probably all have older versions of Excel still, but um, if you uh, crunched a lot of data in Excel, if you were a real sort of financial analyst, uh, you'd used to really get frustrated because uh, you'd get that spinning wheel of death. It would take 20 minutes to process, I don't know, 200,000 rows of data. You know? um, so we did away with that limitation in, uh, in 2010 and 2013 by really sort of adding this in-memory technology uh, into the product, which processes data in memory. So it's, you know, it all processes in, in split-second times, hundreds of millions of rows. Apart from that, though, apart from the in-memory technology, there's also just the ability to really model out your data. So if I think about um, being able to add my own IP to the data, being able to add my own uh, calculated measures and KPIs, um, to be able to join tables together and do everything that a power user is going to want to do, you can do that all from within Excel now. And the real magic is that when I do that, if you're familiar with analysis services, what I'm essentially doing is building a tabular model, right? It's just, it's presented in an end user friendly way, but I, the artifact that I build under the covers into this Excel workbook is a tabular model, a tabular analysis services model. So what that enables is that when end users have published this out across the organization and people are using those tabular models, I as an IT organization can discover those workbooks that end users have created, I can import those into analysis services, and I can, run, I can manage those uh, professionally. I can add role level security, I can partition it, I can just sort of take it to the next level if I want uh, very easily by just importing it into analysis services. So that architecture is something that we thought through uh, to really sort of bridge the gap uh, between what end users are creating, what we're enabling them to do, uh, and making sure that IT has a robust infrastructure to be able to um, intervene if they need to intervene, um, and really sort of uh, take those models to the next level if they need to. So. All right, so for end users, the next step was really about we needed to make the visualizations in Excel more data aware um, and just more robust and more interactive. And that's where PowerView came sort of to, uh, to the rescue in, in 2013, and we embedded uh, Power View right into uh, Excel as a feature. And Power View allows me to have these, uh, this environment where I can actually build out dashboards uh, on top of my models um, that are very interactive. I can see the model sort of in that uh, right hand um, field picker list there. Uh, and I can really sort of very quickly build out um, compelling visualizations uh, to discover insights as well as to share those out with colleagues through through the BI portal, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, and we continue to make these more robust and, and more interesting. So um, the other, tripping over my bag, the other really interesting visualization we introduced this year was Power Map. And Power Map, if you haven't seen it yet, is a 3D um, mapping visualization that really takes a look at geospatial data and allows me to map that data, multiple layers of data, onto a map, uh, explore that data, I drill into it in 3D and all that good stuff, and I'll definitely show you Power Map in a bit here. Um, and now that exercise was actually a really interesting one. So that was Microsoft Research 
the Bing team and Excel all kind of working together to figure out what would be the best visualization for data that we could, uh, for geospatial data that we could bring into Excel. And this is sort of the outcome of that. All right, so enough slides and monologuing. Let's actually get into the product. Okay, so I promised that I would actually build something end to end. And um, let me sort of tee up what we're looking at here. So when I was thinking about this, I wanted to make sure that we took a look at different types of data and how you could bring those different types of data together uh, as a starting point. Um, now we have, uh, obviously, at Microsoft, a facilities team. And we also have an initiative across Microsoft that's focused on monitoring energy usage for all the buildings across Microsoft, discovering interesting insights, and just kind of trying to bring those energy usage costs down to be more uh, efficient. Um, so facilities has provided me with a list here of all the different buildings in Microsoft. We're going to combine that, again, to take over my bag. Uh, we're going to combine that with um, the sensor reading data uh, that's being collected by HD Insight. It's our big data service. Um, so we're just going to tap into HD Insight. All that data is being collected. Bring it into our analysis. And the third bit is I'm also going to connect to some public data and bring that into our analysis as well. So we're going to take a look at connecting small data, which I consider this small data, to big data, to public data. Um, and then we're going to just explore the data and uh, see where it takes us. So with that said, let's get into it. OK, so um, what am I looking at here? So here we can see that the facilities list gives me the name of the building, uh, the location, the lat long of the building, um, the size of the building, and number of floors the building has. Right. So if I go into Power Query, we can see that Power Query allows me uh, to connect to a number of different uh, data sources. So I can get, connect directly to uh, a website if I want, to a number of different flat files, uh, to a number of different databases across my organization. This list continues to grow on a monthly basis. Um, and also um, other data sources, such as uh, I can connect to Facebook, uh, Exchange, Active Directory if I wanted to, um, uh, some public data sources, and also um, HD Insight which is, uh, again, that service that uh, we provide for big data. So I'm going to connect through to HD Insight. And sensor data is the name of the instance. And now what's happening is um, Excel's connecting directly to that service. Uh, and we can see that up there we've got um, this instance, which we'll connect through to. And the data that we're collecting is right here. Now, what Power Query presents me with is a dialog where I can now go and I can refine or I can format that data before I bring it into Excel. So what I'm seeing is a sampling of the data. Um, and I can uh, perform a number of different transforms on this data, which will help create a definition, which the data will flow through as it's being imported into Excel. So let's go ahead and do that. So right away, we can see we've got to do some things to clean up the data here. So I want to use the first row as a header. So it'll change that. We have some encrypted data here that we don't need, so we can remove that. We've got some empty columns. Very easily remove those as well. Um, and then if I take a look at the data types, um, this is actually all text data. So I want to uh, convert this to a date. I need to convert these to numbers. There we go. Now, there's a load of different transforms that I can do to the data um, in this environment. So uh, here, if you take a look at the right-click uh, menu, uh, you can transform uh, the data as it's coming in based on a number of different um, uh, equations. Uh, I can actually also uh, do things like connect through to uh, JSON files uh, and so forth. So there's a, I can. And also, not to, not to miss this one, I can unpivot the data. So end users, financial analysts, actually uh, generally have uh, a lot of needs around being able to unpivot the data. And this is where the, the date dimension is actually on the wrong axis. And they need to be able to unpivot that so that they can actually analyze it effectively inside of Excel. And the tooling will do all that for you, which is um, a tricky thing to do. So once I've got the data just right, and you can see that all the different steps have been captured 
uh, down here as well. Now that's important because I can go back and I can adjust something if I want, say two or three steps back. But also it's, um, it's a, essentially a, a log of all the transforms that have happened to the, that are being uh, applied to the data and that log is maintained. So if I ever go back to this query, I can see all the transforms that happened to the data or if I share this with somebody else across my organization, they can see what changes of, uh, or transforms have happened to the, the raw data as well. So we, we capture all that. Okay, so um, that looks good. So we're just gonna say, okay, apply. And now that data flows through the definition, lands inside of Excel. Um, and the next thing we wanna do is we wanna merge those two data sets to together. So we're gonna com merge our, or combine our small data with our big data here. And how that, uh, how that works is you define the data sets in your environment. So you've got facilities and uh, the streaming data, and then we're just going to add these or link these on ID. So I do that. And then the tool will pop up the dialog again and say, okay, to join these, what um, do you want to pull in which, which, um, uh, which elements from the second query do you want to pull in and merge with the first? And we're going to bring in everything except for the ID. So no, those are joined into one table, and that's great. Okay, so that's step one done. Step two was we were going to combine and join to some public data. So if we go back to Power Query, let's see how this online search thing works. So I'm going to search for weather data in the Redmond area, because I've got this hypothesis that, you know, if the weather fluctuates, that's going to affect the energy usage of the buildings, right? So let's take a look at weather in Redmond, Washington. And we can see a bunch of different public data sources have, have come back. Um, and uh, we've got a, a number of them from Wikipedia. And we're going to combine, or we're going to join this one. And this one actually has a bunch of the different sort of weather in, uh, in the Microsoft region. So you can see the data has come back here. And we're going to do the, exactly the same thing that we did before. We're just going to merge this with our data set. So we're going to take our merged data set that we're working with. We're going to add the climate data. And uh, in this instance, we join month to key and say OK. All right, so from the weather data, what we actually want is just the mean average weather. So we're going to pull that in. And when it pulls it in, it actually, um, in this column, we've got numbers and letters, uh, which is very hard to analyze. So we're just going to strip out the letters from this. Um, so we're going to say, hey, split the column. And it'll strip out all the, uh, all the letters for us, which we don't need. And we'll just remove that. OK, so now we've got our data set. You know, we've just pulled data from multiple different locations. We've cleaned it up. And as an end user, that's a fairly uh, intuitive environment for me to be working in. And then once I've got that all defined, we're going to send it, and we're going to visualize that in Power Map. I just send it straight to Power Map. Now, when I'm importing that data, I can either land that in an Excel spreadsheet or I can send that directly to the model, sort of your choice as an end user. If I send it directly to the model, the in-memory technology, it means I can actually flow hundreds of millions of rows of data into that model and it'll, it'll run in memory, which is, um, uh, which is ideal. So here we have Power Map. And we're going to layer the data onto Power Map. So the first thing we want to see is energy usage. And we're going to zoom in here. And I'm going to add some map labels. So you can see that's Seattle. There's actually Bellevue. And that is actually Microsoft. So we're going to just add a little definition. We're going to reduce the thickness of these bars about that. And you can see what you can do is um, very easily you can sort of pivot around the data. 
um, kind of really see the outliers, zoom in here, and we can see that we've got a couple bars uh, that just skyrocket the other ones, right? Now, let's see what the names of these buildings are, which is a little more useful. Um, if I hover over this really tall one, uh, it's the commons mixer. I'll just to give you a little context as to what you're seeing. At Microsoft, um, we've got a central mall, basically, where everybody goes and has lunch. Uh, and that's called the commons. So the mall obviously has lots of restaurants utilizing lots of energy. So you see that the energy usage for the commons is really, really high, which is intuitive to make sense. Uh, if we have around also, Building 40 has a lot of servers in it. Um, so energy usage very high in Building 40. And then you've got this other one here, Building 121, which isn't particularly um, unique in any way, but it's utilizing a lot of energy, which is kind of interesting. So we might want to keep that in mind. Other things we can do um, is, you know, you can take a look at this uh, by date. So if we want to take a look at how energy fluctuates um, by date, you can actually run that. And you see your little bars move. Um, and you can see sort of, yes, you know, there is a fluctuation in the data. There is some seasonality to the data, um, which is sort of interesting, uh, you know, if you take a look at it from sort of the, the common eye. Uh, also, what you can do is you can layer some data. So if we want to create another layer of data here, uh, let's take a look at that, um, that weather data and see if that is correlated to the fluctuation that we see in energy usage in the buildings. Um, I suspect it is. Uh, so let's take a look at that and, and test that theory out. So um, we can map that here. Take a look at that as a heat map. You might not zoom in so you can actually see this in action. There you go. Um, I'm going to take a look at the average temperature so that mean average that we pulled in. And by time. And you know what? I also have the ability to reduce the influence sphere here, radius. And then if we play that over time, you can see there is sort of this, this correlation, this growth and contraction and expansion um, of the heat in the area, which signals that uh, weather is dropping and rising. And it is correlated uh, to the actual size of the bars, which is our energy consumption. So really interesting sort of tool to test out some hypotheses, visually explore geospatial data, uh, and so forth. And a lot of sort of uh, cool little functionality in here. All right. So let's go back and talk about the service in a little bit. And then we'll, we'll rejoin our demo. And I promise you there's some interesting insights in there. OK, so um, Power BI really is just the service. It's the service that lives in Office 365. Um, and it is the BI portal experience. So I want to talk about what's in that BI portal experience um, that customers are so excited about. So the first is just the site itself, the BI site. And here you can see an image of the BI site. There's a couple of things to bring to your attention around um, how this site is optimized for BI. So the first is, um, obviously, it's very graphical. So I can see live thumbnails of each of the different reports. So when I have lots of reports in here, it's very easy for me to locate the report that I'm looking for. Um, I can just scan the list. I can see uh, what each report is about. The other really interesting thing is that when I go to open up one of these reports in the browser, um, we support much larger file sizes in the browser than uh, Office 365 does just standard for workbooks. So the limit for an Office 365 um, uh, workbook opening up in the browser is 30 megabytes. And for BI, obviously, our workbooks can get quite large as you're crunching a lot of data. So we've beefed that up to 250 megabytes. So now a uh, workbook up to 250 megabytes will open in the browser uh, in HTML5 all the same um, interactive performance that I would expect um, from, uh, uh, from that experience. The reason for that, just to give you a little sort of under the covers kind of explanation as to what's happening, is that what's actually processing the data in this scenario is um, Windows Azure. So uh, it's Windows Azure that's handling all the processing of this data. And that environment obviously 
is tuned for, um, for uh, processing data. And that's what's giving us that ability to really sort of uh, crunch the data very quickly and return the results up to the browser so you can have all the interactivity uh, that you desire. The other really interesting thing is that, you know, a lot of the times you don't want to share or spend the time building out reports for end users. You might just want to share that query that you built in Power Query and then publish that into the environment and let your end users use that as a data source, right? And we've built that into the system as well. So now in Power Query, I don't have to go to you know, the full way, build out the, my Power View report and all that type of stuff, and just build out the query. I can publish that query into the environment, and now my end users can use that um, as a starting point to build their own Power View reports. Um, some really interesting things that we've built into the platform to support this. Uh, the first is, if I'm an end user and I've built out my query, I'm, you know, I've just just built out the thing I showed you, and I publish that into Power BI, and I share it with a colleague, that colleague might not have permissions to the underlying data source, the same permissions that I have. So if they go and they try to access that query, um, and they don't have the right permissions, the system will notify them of that. Sorry, you can't access, uh, ex access uh, two of the four uh, data sources that are in this query. But that end user can then request access. So a workflow will be kicked off to the DBA who owns those data sources, uh, and they can decide whether or not to grant access to that end user. So all that you know, security mechanism uh, for the data, ensuring the data, nobody's accessing the data they can't access, is all built into the system. The other really interesting thing is when I publish this query into Power BI, it gets registered with that data catalog that I was talking about, that search engine my private version of that, my private data catalog. So now, anybody inside my organization, if they search for, uh, for this query, uh, it'll come up in that search. Um, now, that's really important um, for a couple different reasons. And I'll give you an example of this. Um, if I think about you know, providing more collaborative ways and repurposing other people's work, uh, this is actually an ideal way uh, to do that and just increase discovery of what other people have created across the organization. When we released Power Query about a year ago, um, you know, we, we were very interested in, well, are, is anybody downloading it? Right? We, we released it as a, as a preview, a downloadable preview, if you remember this. Um, and it was available on powerbi.com. And, and you know, it had been out for about a week, and we started getting questions. Well, you know, how many downloads do you have, et cetera? So I went, and I was about to um, you know, build a report, access um, ComScore, which is where we have all this data, and it's all captured. But before I did that, I decided to actually uh, run a query to see, not run a query, but run a search to see if anybody else had done the same. And the reason is because Microsoft IT had been dogfooding uh, the product, had released it out to all 100,000 Microsoft employees. So I wanted to see you know, what queries were already in the system and if somebody had created exactly this query I was looking for. And I searched you know, just for Power Query download numbers. I got back um, four different queries that people had already set up uh, doing exactly the same thing. And um, obviously, the engineering team was also very eager to see if their product was being downloaded. So they had all been in there sort of building out their, um, the queries to, to access ComScore. They published that out into the data catalog. It was very easy for me to then just use that as a starting point, build my report in a couple minutes, because the query had already been created. So just an example of this sort of in action. Now, when I actually go and do that, I've shared out my query. I, as the owner of that query, get some diagnostics around who's using my query. So here you can see sort of an image of some diagnostic um, telemetry around who's accessing uh, my queries. So I can see, OK, who's accessing the queries um, and, uh, uh, and how useful are those queries being for other people across the organization. It also allows me to locate the queries I've published out and continue to maintain them. OK, so the next really interesting thing that we've built into the Power BI system is the notion of data refresh. So one of the challenges, obviously, with the cloud is when you take a report and you publish it into the cloud, um, that report can become stale very quickly. 
you need some way to be able to refresh the data in that report. And we've built uh, what we call the data management gateway into Power BI. It's an agent that I maintain as an IT organization. I uh, have that on premises. And it's up to me to um, elect which data sources I want to be refreshable from the cloud. Um, and really, it allows me to facilitate that data refresh for my end users. So now when an end user publishes a report into the cloud, uh, it can be refreshed. It goes back on premise, fetches the data, and refreshes um, the model inside of the workbook up in Power BI. Um, so that's, uh, that's a really important uh, feature for a lot of our customers, this ability to reach all the way through the firewall back on premises uh, to fetch the data. So we talked a little bit about um, this notion of, of data search and the, the private data catalog. Um, and just to summarize what I, I've been saying about this, this data catalog, it's really a private data search engine that you can use to index your corporate data sources. It remembers, it, it indexes all the queries that end users are sharing amongst themselves across your organization. Um, and the really important thing from an IT perspective with the private data catalog is the telemetry that IT gets out of it as well. So built into the uh, private data catalog is an understanding and, to, and um, metrics around data usage patterns across your organization. So you get a view as to who's accessing data across my organization, where's that data flowing, who's sharing data with who, and which data sources are of most interest across my organization. That'll help um, you, know, you sort of make um, costing and budgeting decisions around which data sources to maintain uh, or, or to, to strip out because nobody's actually using them. So some really interesting intel that comes out of uh, the data catalog as well. So again, this notion of kind of building that, that governance right into the system. So end users can go out, create what they want to create, um, but you can take on a role where you can actually see what's happening in the system and intervene if you need to. So a lot of thinking um, on that front has gone into the product. Okay, the next really important thing that we've built into Power BI is mobility. Um, and there's two ways that we do this. So one, the reports render in HTML5, and they're getting richer and great new functionality all the time. And what that means is that um, I can open up, I can navigate to that workbook, and I can open it on any device, Android, uh, iPad, uh, Windows, whatever it happens to be, uh, and I can explore that report. The second thing we're doing is we're building native apps uh, for a number of different tablets. So the first one that we released at GA was the Windows uh, mobile app. And the, uh, the Windows mobile app gives me this environment. You can see it here. We can see a number of your favorite different reports that um, are flagged in your Power BI site. Uh, allows you to explore those reports, uh, email out to a colleague if something looks wrong. All this kind of stuff's built right into that native app. Now, what we're also um, going to do is provide a native app for uh, iPad as well. So the iOS uh, app will come out in the next uh, few months. Uh, so we're actually saying um, uh, H2 of 2015 was a couple months out. Um, and that iPad will be out there uh, so that uh, you can have that same experience uh, on iOS. Next, and I promise we'll get to the demo soon, um, is natural language query. So um, we continue to look at the cloud as a way where we can test out new features, um, really track uh, the benefit of those features, and then make our decisions around what goes into the box down the road, because we're on different cycles. The cloud, we can update, and we do, multiple different times a month. Um, but the box software is on this sort of 18-month or so cycle. Um, so it allows us to get features out uh, quicker. One of those features is natural language query. And the way natural language query works is that a lot of our uh, more casual users don't want to build queries. They don't want to open Excel. They don't want to do any of that. Um, they want to just find a way to interact with the system where they can ask questions of the data. Um, the system will, you know, understands the semantics and the intent of those questions and presents answers in the form of interactive charts and graphs to the end user. And we call that natural language query. 
Um, and exactly the way it works is that when you build a model and you publish it into Power BI, you can elect for that to be a data source for natural language query. And from that point on, the uh, natural search engine uh, will take care of all the other details. So we're going to see that in a, in a demo because it's just easier to see and understand in demo. Um, and I uh, promise that I'll, I'll also activate it as well. So you can see how you would activate that. All right. So this is Power BI. This is the portal. Um, and here, just to give you a quick tour, um, we've got um, sort of our favorite reports up along the top here. Um, and we've got this report down here, which is exactly the report that I just created for you. So I, I wanted to um, do everything from scratch from one end to the other. So uh, I loaded it up here. And what you do as a next step to get it ready for Q&A is you can see on the drop-down list here, you've got Add to Q&A. So um, this is where you actually elect that this is one of those models that I want Q&A to be able to recognize. And then when I go into Q&A, this is how I would interact with it. So I go into the Q&A environment. I just give it a second because I, I've just elected for it to be um, visible. Usually I skip this step, this step from the demo, but I'll just show you end to end. Um, and then the way you interact is say, show me total energy. Oh. It recognizes that I spelt it wrong, but still shows me total energy. So um, that's all the energy usage across Microsoft um, all kind of being aggregated for me. Now, that, that aggregated total actually doesn't live in the model. So the, the, um, the engine sort of understood that I was looking for an aggregate, took a look at the model, aggregated it up, and showed me the end result. Um, so I can take a look at, say, total energy by date. There you go. So uh, Power BI shows me you know, the appropriate chart uh, for that. You can also say, well, that's interesting, but show me total energy by building. That might be more int interesting to me. It takes a look at that, and then stack ranks um, energy usage by building um, across Microsoft. So it understands um, what I'm looking for, and then you know, shows me the best visualization for that, and stack ranks it for me. Uh, I might want to take a look at total energy by people in the building. Versus people. So understands the concept of versus as well. Um, and here we can see what it's shown me is based on the number of users in a building, um, mapping that out against total energy um, consumption for that building. So what you would expect is to see the strong correlation. You know, the more people in the building, the more energy is going to be used by that building. And that's definitely true um, for most of these buildings, as you see, sort of this natural, uh, this natural sort of trend line. Uh, there are outliers, right? So the commons mixer, uh, definitely an outlier. Now, the commons mixer doesn't have as many people actually in that building because it's a giant cafeteria, right? So the number of people actually, asso actually assigned to that building is low. But because of the nature of the building, it uses a lot of energy. So that shows up as an outlier. And this building 121 really shows up as an outlier as well. So here you've got a building that's using more, proportionally more energy uh, than it should based on the number of people that are actually in it. So that's kind of interesting. So let's explore that in a little bit more detail. So we'll take a look at uh, total energy by date building 121 versus my building. Oh. It's rendering in the chart. 121 versus building 109. And here you can see when uh, you take a look at the, the comparison between this building 121 and another building, 109, you can see uh, that in the winter months, 
Actually, this building 121 utilizes a lot of energy compared to, say, an average building. Um, and this was actually interesting. So when facilities found this out, they went and they, found out, they wanted to find out why, right? And a lot of the, the theories were, well, maybe we need to insulate that building a little better. You know, maybe it's, it's losing a lot of energy um, and it, because of insulation in the winter. Uh, turns out the real reason that this particular building uh, was using a lot of energy, and it's kind of a funny story, uh, it happens to be a sales office and um, with a lot of execs in it. And they all have really nice cars. And the garage they actually had it heated in the winter months because they wanted their cars you know, to be nice and warm and toasty in the winter months. So as soon as facilities found this out, they went in there and they shut down the, um, the heat to the garage. So uh, this, in recent months, is kind of normalized down. So interesting insights when you look at the data that you can actually act on. So I thought that was a funny story. All right. So there is one last thing. So uh, last month, not last month, last week, we released features so quickly to the cloud. So last week, we, um, we released a new feature for Power BI as well. Um, so I wanted to spend a little time on that. Um, and you can just sort of expect to see this, um, you know, in this new rhythm that engineering's in. You, they're going to just release features um, very, very quickly now. But one of them is around uh, forecasting. So we've built into PowerView the ability to forecast forward. And I just want to show you kind of the scope of what that does. Um, so at Microsoft, we've got uh, you know, a, lot of, uh, a lot of data scientists, actually, a lot of people um, who've got sort of a lot of intelligence around um, a lot of predictive modeling capabilities that we leverage sort of internally uh, for managing things like um, Azure and Office 365 and telemetry and all that kind of stuff. Um, and that team went off for a year and thought through what's the best model for forecasting that we could build in uh, into the product. And they've uh, actually came up with two, and they built them right in. One t accounts for seasonality and one doesn't. Um, and I'm just going to take you uh, through the experience from an end user's perspective to, um, to actually leverage the, the new capabilities. So here you can see we've got a time series. And when I hover over the time series, I have this little blue line, a little dot that shows up. And I can actually drag that forward. And the product will actually forecast well, forward for me. There we go. Drop that. And um, so it's forecasted uh, forward uh, based on the series of data I have. It auto-detects whether that data has seasonality or doesn't have seasonality in it. It will apply the right uh, model to it. If I'm eyeballing it and I don't want to have it in auto mode, I can adjust and change for seasonality. So uh, if I don't want to uh, have any seasonality applied to uh, the time series, I can just drag it over to none. And you can see that using the other model does not elicit really good results. Um, I can also change the seasonality. So seasonality is currently set to um, a year, so 12 monthly units. Uh, I could change that to say uh, 52 if I wanted to for some reason. You can see how it adjusts uh, the result set. So we'll take it back to auto. Um, I can also adjust or check uh, for confidence intervals, right? So I can set a range for this. If I want uh, one standard deviation, I can uh, apply that. And you can see the confidence interval shows up in my chart, two standard deviations. You can see the, the range widens as well. It's really interesting. Um, the other interesting thing is it does um, uh, hind casting as well. So the way that hind casting works is that uh, when I'm looking at the uh, results, uh, I might be interested to see, well, how would it have predicted uh, the last year had I applied this a year ago, right? That's what we refer to as hind casting. And if you, you can actually apply that by just dragging the other end over. Um, and it'll actually show you how predictive the model would have been uh, on the data that, uh, that you just had for the last year. You can see it's kind of close and kind of interesting. Um, also, if I've got outliers, I can adjust for outliers. So say, uh, maybe I consider this an outlier for some reason. You know, I can do some what if, and I can play around with the outliers. And we can see how that would adjust 
uh, the model as well. Didn't really affect it very much. Let's see if we can do it. This one too. And that'll sort of adjust your, your model as you go through. So those are sort of the key features that are kind of built in to, uh, into the new forecasting capabilities in PowerView. This is an example of where the product will actually go going forward. Uh, we'll continue to invest in these uh, predictive capabilities being built into it and really designed in a way to be very sort of intuitive for an end user to interact with. So that was cool, and I wanted to, to show you that. Um, OK, so uh, before we get to Q&A or questions, um, there is sort of an interesting case study I wanted to share with you. Um, so Mediacom is one of our uh, customers that was in the preview for Power BI. Again, Power BI just released two months ago. Um, and a uh, really interesting case study uh, where their challenge was they uh, ran programs across a number of different marketing channels, right? So digital channels and TV and all this different stuff. And they had to collect data from Nielsen and you know, Twitter and Facebook, aggregate that up to be able to communicate back how effective the campaigns were being to their customers. Um, and that process took them a couple of weeks to do with uh, the tooling that they were using. So they tried Power BI, they tried Excel, they were able to connect to all the data sources they needed to connect to. They had refreshable, refreshable reports, so it's very easy for them to um, you know, track the, the success of the, uh, how about I show that? Like this. <laughs> Uh, to track the success of the, uh, of the campaigns. Um, and then when they actually published out uh, the model, they found a, an other interesting benefit from that Q&A functionality. So they published these models they created into uh, Power BI, and now their account managers were able to uh, answer customer questions just using Q&A uh, against those models, and allowed them to provide answers to their customers uh, while they were on the phone. Uh, very, very quickly, and it just uh, you know, increased customer satisfaction because the, the, you know, the customers were very pleased that they were able to get answers uh, to their, um, about their campaigns at a much quicker pace uh, from the account managers who weren't going to build reports anyways. They were going to have to call somebody uh, to build reports for them. So um, in the customer's voice, let's actually uh, just play the video and let them talk uh, to the solution. Fundamentally, the biggest challenge that Mediacom is going to face is separating the management of critical data from strategic upstream conversations about what will drive growth for our clients. Competition in our industry is really fierce. Where it has changed in the last 10 or so years is the pace at which change affects the industry. In today's digital world of real time, our ability to provide a health check to our clients' connectivity across paid on dinner media is vital in terms of the health of a brand. The expectation of a Super Bowl spot is that we are able to report performance across all media platforms, whether it be television, digital, social, and search. Having the understanding and having the right efficiencies to manage data for a global client within the local markets is one of our most difficult challenges. There are several very, very powerful and very intensive BI solutions that are on the marketplace today. However, our users do not have the patience or the skill set to be able to use these tools. The one tool that we have found that every single employee from the CEO to the receptionist knows and understands is Excel. We were introduced to Power BI and we realized that if Microsoft is going to build something to make Excel more powerful from a BI standpoint, will ultimately make the lives of every employee better. So the fact that Power BI is built on the Office 365 suite, all we have to do is turn it on and turn it off. We do not need to deploy any new infrastructure or any new architecture. We know that we will not have to train our people to understand its uses and its capabilities. They will figure it out on their own. We'll give the average user the ability to be a query expert by inserting natural language into the Q&A module. The collaboration capabilities give us the ability to share reports, not only internally from business team to business teams, but also give us the ability to share reports directly with our clients. Power BI offers an amazing solution for us in terms of delivering dashboard products for clients who operate in very complicated environments. And that means we get to have meaningful conversations in the boardroom with our clients 
on how we can grow their business. All right, so I actually find that a really interesting case study. Um, all right, so just uh, to close off, uh, if you do want to go and try Power BI and you haven't yet, if you go to PowerBI.com, uh, you can sign up for a trial of the service um, as well as the latest Excel 2013 client if you don't have it. Um, and you can, uh, there's a lot of sort of content up there that you can play with and just test out this solution for yourself. So with that, I did promise uh, a Q&A session at the end. So uh, we made pretty good time. We've got about 15 minutes left. So if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to... Feel free to ask. Yeah. So um, if I just uh, rephrase what you said, so the question was, um, you know, Q&A is great um, for sort of discovery. I can check out and find results, but how do I actually share that? end result with somebody if I discover an insight um, through the dashboard. So the way that the product works is uh, you can. So if I actually find um, an interesting insight and an interesting query, I can actually save that result uh, back to Power BI. It'll show up as a tile in Power BI. And now when I go to click that tile, it'll take me directly to that spot uh, uh, that I was in. So you can share those insights with others. Oh, sorry, follow-up question. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, the, and the forecasting bit um, is available right now. So we just released that feature last week. Um, so if you want to go check out the, uh, the forecasting capabilities, um, they're good to go. Now, one thing to keep in mind um, is that HTML5 is going to become our default experience for Power View um, in the very near future. Uh, so that particular feature is only in the HTML5 version of Power View. So when you go and, and test it out, if you're hovering over this line chart and you're like, where's this blue? bubble that Michael was talking about, uh, make sure you switch over, to, toggle over to the HTML5 version. Uh, that's where you'll find it. So. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Did you, I got this light in my eyes. I'll come over to you right after your question. Do you know if this Power View is part of the Office 365 subscription? Sorry, say that again? And do you know if Power View, sorry, Power BI is, is part of the Office 365 subscription? Ah. So um, Power BI is um, a, um, a subscription of its own inside the Office 365 suite. So um, if you have, um, it's not part of, say, E3 or one of these other subscription models, uh, but you have, if you have E3, uh, it's a very, there's an add-on version that will give you the Power BI capabilities as well. So it's a very easy add-on into that environment. going to be rolling this out in a few months, and there were some awesome. questions on that. And uh, the idea that if the end users are creating these queries against possibly operational data, other things, you know, in today's world, a developer writes that, it's tuned, it's checked, it's double checked before it goes out. What prevents the end users from writing really bad queries, I guess, that would just drag down the whole system? Yeah, so um, it's a good question. The I guess there really isn't, right? So, <laughs> um, in the system, uh, I get, if I access, I'll just sort of repeat the, the question here. Um, I can use Power Query, I can access uh, different data sources. Um, if I write a bad query, then um, you know, that could bring down the whole system. Power Query is actually designed in a way where I, I shouldn't be necessarily building my own um, SQL queries. I should be able to be using the Power Query interface uh, to pull that data in. Uh, and the Power Query interface should be helping to optimize how that data is um, accessed and pulled through. Now, there is that one sort of uh, create my own SQL query option, which they could use. And in that situation, then, um, if you've got a query that's bringing in the system, um, you should be able to detect it uh, and then uh, shut it down if you need to shut it down. OK. Yeah. Okay. Quick follow-up. Yeah. So you talked about that being role-based. So is that something where maybe that piece, the actual query writing, could be role-based, and they, you know, that that would be published and deactivated and the end users based on roles. Be able to, to write that, they would just, I guess, search and take advantage of different published queries. 
that's another way you could do it as well, right? So you could just take control of um, what you want to surface up. So it's up to you to decide what um, data sources you want to make available in the private data catalog. Okay. Um, so if you want, you could actually create a layer between um, direct access to the database and just write a bunch of queries that end users can then access and use those as starting points. And then you know those queries are optimized. Okay. Um, so that, that's probably another way to do it as well. Thanks. You're welcome. Yeah, I just had a question about the data refresh piece for Power BI. Uh, we use a lot of tabular models and SSAS queues. Um, does that support a data type, or is that going to be supported in the future to be able to link to SSAS? Yeah, so the, um, uh, absolutely. Uh, so the ability to go to Power Query and actually access uh, analysis services tabular models so that I can start building out um, is, is something that will definitely be supported in the future. Actually, to actually go beyond that, just to give a full answer. So if, as we think about analysis services playing a role uh, here, um, there's a lot of different scenarios where we want to make sure analysis services um, can plug into the Power BI environment, right? So one is Power Query needs to be able to access analysis services. We'll absolutely do that. Um, another one is, hey, what if I want to go above the 250 megabyte limit of, uh, of Excel? And I want to just create a tabular model and publish that tabular model into Power BI with role-based security, with partitioning, whatever it happens to be. Um, that scenario is also something um, that uh, will be supported in the product as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Back here. Sorry, in the back there. Yeah, hey. hey. Um, in the keynote this morning, when they were doing the Power BI demo, and the guy was doing the Q&A part where he was asking for you know, tweet satisfaction on where the, where the bicycles are, Right. You know, there was a, with a happy tweets versus dissatisfied tweets. How, how does the system know what's a happy tweet or an yeah. angry tweet? So yeah, where does the sentiment analysis happen uh, there? So in the, um, in the demo this morning, I think the, the sentiment was built into the model, um, if, I, if I recall correctly. Um, there's also other sentiment engines that uh, we have at, at Microsoft that you'll see sort of making their way into product as well that'll help automate a lot of that. Um, the Dynamics team just purchased a company, I forget the name right now, but uh, that was focused very much on, on sentiment analysis. So one of the things we're exploring is how do you just make that part of the, the Power BI environment. Yeah, okay, thanks. So, Um, I think that may have answered my question too, but I was wondering if you could expose measures that you've created into the Q&A sort of search capability. Sorry, expose? Uh, um, measures that you've created on a model, if you could expose that in the Q&A search. Ah, um, let me think that one through. Yeah, I think today it's not supported, um, but uh, yeah, definitely the, the intent is to make the, the models very robust. So uh, a couple of things when I'm tweaking a model for Q&A. One is um, the full model should show up in, in Q&A. And if it isn't today, it should be very shortly. Um, the other thing is semantics. So tuning a model for semantics is very important. Um, today, the ability to add additional semantics into a model is supported. So if I'm building my power pivot model, and I know that um, you know, there's five or six different terms that my organization's using that really kind of mean the same thing. I can build those additional terms into the model, and then Q&A will be able to read all those different synonyms and, uh, and present the data more effectively. Okay, so um, you can, so like you can continue to refine eggs. that as well. OK, cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, I had a couple questions. Sure. Um, first is about the kind of ETL process that can be done in Power BI. So if I have a user pull in a lot of data and they, they kind of scrub it beforehand, uh, they, they look at some things just like you did up on, on the screen, um, you convert it to integers and things like that. Um, is that is that whole process is that recorded so that later, like if the developers need to bring that data in for actual reports, they can uh, th they can basically understand the the entire ETL process because it's it's uh, it's been transparent that way. Like not just not just uh, converting down like converting numbers and some of the other transformations, but like 
joining. Um, let's say we want to find two people's names and you want to do, use some sort of master data, data management or um, use a, a dictionary trying to find like Mike with Michael and just some sort of um, uh, equality uh, comparison. Is, is it pretty transparent what Power BI does? That Yeah. So, so a couple things. So one is I showed that audit trail, right? So in the first scenario where my end users created something and um, I want to then reproduce that um, in IT, I can go into the workbook, I can go into the queries that they've created, and I can see exactly the transforms that they've applied to the data. Mm -hmm. And then um, with that, I can go and I can just sort of recreate that query if I want to. Um, there's today, um, there isn't the ability to just uh, automate that. It's a manual process. So I'd have to take a look at everything that they've done and then apply that. Um, but the automated one's a really interesting one as well. Do I want to be able to just consume that and then take off from there is an interesting thought. Um, the second bit around, um, which I, I think is more around data quality uh, is the question. And um, you know, what are we doing around just building in some data quality type of algorithms and, and engines into the service as well? So nothing to share on that front yet, but it's definitely a scenario that we're looking at because as you think about you know, DQS, data quality services, uh, that we released, um, I guess, back in 2012 R2, you know, uh, there were some great data quality uh, capabilities built into SQL Server. How do we pull those forward into, SQL, into Power BI's? Sort of another question that we have, and we're kind of looking at, at those scenarios. Awesome, thanks. One small question too. Yeah. Um, the, the natural language query, that, that looks really great. Yeah. How, how does it generally map? Like if, if a user asks a question that perhaps the data can't answer, does it, um, it, it I'm sure it gracefully handles that, but uh, what, or if the, if the user types in a question that um, uh, requires like some, uh, s s some additional algorithms, um, does the, does the uh, engine have like machine learning algorithms and some, some forecasting built in that, that will automatically take the natural language that was written and, and automatically uh, run those type of things? Yeah, so there's two ways to do, um, uh, just for context, there's two ways to do sort of natural language queries. One is uh, semantic matching and the other one is machine learning. And the semantic matching is essentially, hey, um, based on what you've typed, uh, map that to my model and make some smart decisions as to how to generate the query and provide some, um, some views, right? right. Um, so in the first iteration, uh, we're, using sort of, we're using that, that method, the, the matching, which works really, really well um, because the model itself is in sort of a confined space, right? You kind of have a set parameters around the model itself, and you can add additional semantics and that type of thing. Um, to be able to then extend that out and add some additional machine learning where the, um, the engine learns from the types of questions that everybody keeps asking of the data and then builds that into um, you know, being able to provide better queries is something that you know, down the road uh, we might explore. Um, but today we find the matching works really well because the models are contained. So um, you know, today it's the matching, tomorrow it might be machine learning. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks. Uh, I have two quick questions. With the power map, can we use our own maps? Like say if I wanted to map information just in my data center. Ah, um, good question. Um, so today I believe the power maps are just kind of what's provided in the system. Um, but I know there has been a lot of discussion around that. So um, I don't have an answer for you. I don't believe you can today. Uh, but I'd ask the Power Map guys. They're down in the booth if you want to swing by uh, and just see if there's some way to import, um, you know, your own private maps data center or, you know, your production line or whatever it happens to be. Okay. And yeah. my second question is: with the forecasting models, is there or will there be an API where developers could implement their own forecasting models? It's an excellent question. So not today. Uh, we just released the feature, um, and it's the, the two models that are under the covers. Um, and uh, yeah, not sure sort of how open it'll become going forward, but it is an interesting idea where you, know, you might have data scientists want, want to create their own specific models to enable their end users to then utilize in the tooling. It's a good scenario. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So my first question is actually related to the forecasting as well. So if you create forward-looking forecasting, is there a way to then extract the raw data that's behind the visualization? 
Um, like if we wanted to forecast product sales or um, customer revenue, something like that, could we then get at the data points used to map it? Right. Um, so there's no way to export in this iteration uh, the forecasted data points. Um, they just get rendered in the visualization. Uh, but it's, a, it's an interesting idea, so I'll take that back to engineering. Perfect. So actually, can I just join to his question? Sure. So the thing is, like, I just saw that the only thing that's available right now is a line chart in forecasting. Yes. So if you want to kind of use that for anything else, it will be good at least if we can get that data points. Then we can take the data and manually co-generate the reports that we want with com more complex graphs. Right. Because, like, we don't have more complex graph forecasting, and yeah. we don't have data points, then it's kind of really not much useful just with a single line graph. Yeah. No, it totally makes sense. And um, it's actually a really good point um, around how interesting the cloud's starting to become. Because what this has allowed us to do is release a feature that might be a bit limited, right? It's, it's one line chart. You can forecast, use the models, and then allow us to learn as we go along and start to build in new features based on the feedback we get from it. So this is exactly the type of feedback we're looking for. And then it allows us to sort of build that in the next month and continue to kind of refine the feature with a lot of um, you know, general uh, taking a look at the data and understanding how the, the products are being used. So I think it'll, be, it'll so be good for us. One of the things we are doing is kind of trying to look at how, much, how many machines teams are using that yeah. we support. And then like we kind of look at how many are unavailable available and then kind of being used. And then we kind of take that data and project the next one, one and a half year. Got so it. It'll, it'll be really useful if we know that kind of data so that we can project forward. So. Got it. Perfect. Good use case. Thank you. Yeah. Um, my second question was, uh, our organization uses dynamic CRM and then also right now GP, but potentially Exapta in the future. Yeah. Um, are you going to have kind of automated data connectors for Power BI that understand the configured condition of those two Microsoft Solutions. Yeah. yeah, so you can connect to dynamic CRM today. It's a just hidden directly. feature. <laughs> it's very hidden. Um, we just have to do a better job of calling it out in the, in the dialogue. But uh, if you use an OData feed, there's, a, there's an actual um, blog post on powerbi.com connecting to CRM online data. Uh, and it's done through the OData feed. And the OData feed allows you to connect through directly to the CRM system and consume that in Power BI. Even if it's an on-prem CRM system? Um, today... It's CRM online direct. Okay. Um, not sure if you can do it on-prem. Okay. Yeah. But it'd be called out in the blog post if you want to go identify it. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other questions? No? All right, thanks. So I'll be in the booth if you have any other uh, follow-up questions uh, for Power BI. The first one, of course, is around this notion of big data. And I know that's not a term that's new to anybody in this room. Um, but a lot of people have different definitions of big data. Um, and for me, I have a pretty simple mind. Uh, I like to kind of route it or uh, ground it in actual scenarios. So big data for me, apart from just large quantities of data, different types of data sort of coming um, on the scene, it's really about being able to leverage uh, data types that are new and unique and have been difficult to access in the past. For example, uh, sensor data, um, a lot of organizations are doing more with sensor data, RFID tags and that type of thing. If I think about social analytics, a lot of people are tapping into uh, social media to gain more insights into what their customers are actually talking about so that it can feed the decisions that are being made in the organization and so forth. Uh, also, public data is uh, becoming a lot more prevalent. If I think about the data.gov initiatives and some of the other data that's out there, being able to tap into that more easily and bring that into your analysis is an area where we focus. So um, that's what sort of we, we mean by uh, big data is there's um, obviously a lot of different elements to it, but really the changing data types out there and levering to, leveraging those is an area of interest for us. The other core trend that we really track is around this notion of consumerization of IT. And again, I'm really simple. So when I think about consumerization of IT, I really think that's just about choice. I is an experience um, in a matter of minutes so that people can start to share workbooks and it's fully rich and everything's sort of built into that experience and self-provisioned is um, really reducing a lot of the barriers to deploying BI. And that's just another example of how we see ourselves being able to make sort of data and data usage more uh, pervasive and more accessible to a lot of people. 
So Power BI, of course, is a subset of our all-up uh, BI approach. Um, and I'm going to focus now sort of on two elements of what uh, we do for self-service BI, two parts of the equation, if you will. Uh, the first is everything that we do inside of Excel. And Excel is the BI end user client for us, right? So we started down this journey about six years ago to really transform what Excel was into a full-fledged BI tool. And you know, the first thing we introduced back then was Power Pivot. And Power Pivot was this in, or is, this in-memory technology um, that we built right into Excel. And it allowed for um, power users to more easily model out data, run and crunch that data in memory uh, so that they got the performance that they wanted when they were actually uh, processing data. Um, now, we've expanded that self-service BI experience since then in a couple of ways. One is the biggest hurdle that we saw for our end users to access information was finding the information they wanted to get, the data they wanted to get. You know, they, for them, it was very difficult. End user want to be able to work on whatever device I want to work on from wherever I want to work. Um, and that's uh, something that we're definitely tracking to in product and uh, building to satisfy that solution. So we'll talk about uh, that as well. Um, and then I added a quote here, which I thought was interesting, because it was the first time I actually saw quant around this. But essentially, and just to paraphrase what Gartner's saying is, hey, if you're an organization that's leveraging some of these new data types um, and bringing those inside the organization and making it easier for your end users to tap into that, well, you're probably going to outperform those organizations that don't do that by about 20%, which I thought was a really interesting stat. So I wanted to throw it up there. At Microsoft, when we think about um, the approach to uh, self-service BI or the, the space of self-service BI, uh, we really are kind of focused on making data more accessible. If I was to kind of boil it down to one thing, it's about that accessibility point. And we're really looking to do it in two ways. One is um, Excel itself. So Excel is a very accessible tool. Um, and because it's very pervasive, by delivering our BI capabilities, or end user BI capabilities, through that tool, it just helps make data access um, more accessible to more people. And that's why we do what we do with Excel, to really make it a full-fledged BI tool. And we'll talk a lot about that today. Um, the other thing that really makes BI a lot more accessible is some of the investments we're making in the cloud. You know, being able to uh, stand up uh, a BI portal experience. All right. Let me kick things off now. So uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for uh, making it uh, down the hallway all the way to 332. Um, as I walked in, I realized that they changed the actual title of this session. So what I submitted was Power BI Overview. And what uh, it landed as is uh, everything you need to know about Power BI. So that's an overpromise. Um, but I am planning to step through end-to-end um, -end what the solution looks like. Um, and I'm actually planning to build something um, on stage from scratch. So we'll just start from one end, and we'll just walk all the way through to the other end. And hopefully, that'll give you a good feel for what the product is. And um, if uh, everything goes to plan, uh, we should have about 10 minutes or so at the end uh, for just some Q&A. So if you have any questions that you want to fire at me, feel free to do that. Prep ahead of time um, you know, as, uh, as I'm going through the, the session. And uh, we, should, uh, we should have about 10 minutes for that. I should also mention that this is sort of the overview session. So there are a bunch of drill down sessions uh, through the course of the week uh, for Power BI into all the topics that you'll see. So if you want to go deeper uh, in a particular area, there is a drill down session for that uh, in the agenda. So with that, let me start with um, why we do what we do uh, for Power BI, uh, just to set some context um, and some of the the trends that we're tracking um, in the product team. To even know who the, uh, who the IT person to contact was, who the DBA in their organization was, let alone you know, understanding how to connect to that data, what their, creden their credentials need to be, the access strings, and all that kind of stuff. So we've built some new capabilities into Excel to make that a lot easier. Um, and we'll talk about that today. Um, and it, we also have built new capabilities in for end users to be able to clean up the data as they're pulling it in. So um, a lot of challenges, uh, the biggest challenge I hear from customers is, hey, I just need to 
pull data from multiple different sources together. I need to clean it, and I need to be able to analyze that. Help me do that uh, as in, from an end user perspective. Um, and we're doing a lot of that with the Power Query technology, and I'll, I'll show that uh, in action in our demo in a bit. Um, the next area is around visualization. So once I've got the data, I've modeled it out, it's running in memory, you know, how do I actually layer on really compelling visualizations to be able to explore my data? And we're doing a lot on this front as well. So uh, if, uh, if you're familiar, uh, we've built out some, uh, some new visualizations into Excel, the PowerView technology, the, uh, the PowerMap technology as well, and we'll talk about those today. So once I've actually con you know, I've created my content, I've created my report, um, Power BI is then all about sharing that out. It's the service that runs in Office 365, which gives me the BI portal experience so that I, as an end user who've created something inside of Excel, I can publish that out 